Florida. I was telling the staff about this this morning. Uh, I had to go to Florida this weekend for a meeting. And uh, it was so funny watching everybody come from Chicago and get off the plane. And we all have our masks on and everybody said, you and you walk out and you look around and realize, oh, we're the only people with masks because <laughs> there's no masks in Florida. Take off your gloves, take off your hat. Yeah, take off your hat, your gloves. <laughs> that, and, funny, and, and by the way, that's kind of funny too because you, we all get off with our overcoats on and everything yeah. and it's 80 degrees. <laughs> I've seen something, uh, one of those little joke things where they show people standing in line at the airport six feet apart. Right. And then they go, so we did this to do this. Then you're right. on a plane and you're jammed. Right, yeah. you're jammed side by that side. That makes no sense. Right. Right. <laughs> Yeah. The, the only time that I am, oh, wait a minute, who's this? Oh, Sarah, where's the live stream? Some of us want to, oh, it says it's on, I don't know. Yeah, she says it's not there. Oh, no, there she said, oops, never mind, it just came on. Okay. All right. Uh, yeah, she, well, see, it's a, there's a delay. Yeah. Um, what was I going to say? The, oh, the only I, I, the only thing that's really nice about masks is uh, walking the dog when it's twenty degrees outside, or or twenty. Or I, I realize, man, this is much more pleasant. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We have to, right. Well, I, I could use some of that. It doesn't hurt me. All right. Dina's here. Good. I guess we're going to have to go to Sunrise now in, in addition to Beacon Hill, huh? No. Uh, they came here, I guess. Yes, they did. Yeah. Uh, what, uh, Ron Nordman has joined the church. And uh, and I asked him if he needed me to come see him because I knew he was at Sunrise. He said, no, I can get a ride. And so apparently the, the, he's gonna. they're going to have the bus yeah. bring whoever wants to come. Yeah. yeah. They got to say yep. That's great. No, no, she passed away some years ago now. Yeah. Who did this? That was Cindy Sullivan. Yes. And they talked. He actually, before he went there, was the Crescent Street somewhere. Oh. Sarah says, wearing a mask has made it super awkward walking past people, though. No one can say, see that I give them a smile. So it's super awkward when I just stare at them. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so let's begin with prayer. Lord Jesus, we give you thanks uh, for gathering us together tonight as we continue studying your prophets. We ask you, Lord, to open our hearts and our minds to their word, that we might hear you speak through them. This we ask in your name. Amen. All right, we've made it to Hosea, and uh, Hosea is one of my favorites. Uh, he's a good one. And let's read Luther on Hosea, which I handed out to you. And this is, again, this is from the study Bible, just a reprint from the study Bible. Hosea lived and preached, as he himself indicates in the title, 1-1, at the time of the second and last Jeroboam, king of Israel, Jeroboam II. This was the, the same time in which Isaiah and also Amos and Micah were living in Judah, but Hosea was the oldest of them. Jeroboam, too, was a fine and prosperous king who did much for the kingdom of Israel, as 2 Kings 14, which we'll read some of later, testifies. Nevertheless, he persisted in the old idolatry of his ancestors, the kings of Israel. Thus, although there were truly many fine men in the nation at that time, they still could not make the people righteous. For the devil had to inflict this misery on the people, that they always killed the prophets and sacrificed their children to the idols and so filled the land with blood guiltiness because of which he here in chapter 1, verse 5, threatens Jezreel. It appears, however, as though this prophecy of Hosea was not fully and entirely written, but that pieces and saves were taken out of his preaching and brought together into a book. Nevertheless, we can trace and discover it in it this much at least, that he performed the two offices fully and boldly. First, he preached vigorously against the idolatry of his time and bravely rebuked the people together with the king and his princes and priests. 
It was surely for this reason that he, like the others, tasted death. He had to die as a heretic against the priests and as a rebel against the king. For that is a prophetic and apostolic death. And in this way, Christ himself had to die. Second, he also prophesied powerfully and most comfortingly, comfortingly about Christ and his kingdom, as is shown particularly in chapters 2, 13, and 14. But no one should think because he uses the words harlot and harlotry many times, and in chapter 1, 2 through 3, take, takes a wife of harlotry, that he was unchaste in his words and deeds. For Hosea is speaking allegorically, okay, that's Luther's opinion, this wife of harlotry, harlotry is his lawfully wedded wife, hey Deb, and with her he begot legitimate children. The wife and children, however, had to bear those shameful names as a sign and rebuke to the idolatrous nation. That's Luther's opinion. I don't agree. For it was full of spiritual harlotry, that is, idolatry, as Hosea himself says in the text. The land commits great harlotry by forsaking the Lord. In the same way, Jeremiah wore the wooden yoke and carried the cup in Jeremiah 27 and 25. Indeed, it was common for all the prophets to be doing some strange thing as a sign to the people. So here, Hosea's wife and children had to have names of harlotry as a sign against the whoring, idolatrous nation. For it is incredible that God should order a prophet to practice a harlotry, as some interpret this packet passage in Hosea to mean. It's, it's, um, first of all, I think uh, whoring and harlotry are way underused words these days. Um, and they I use, they use it in uh, Ezekiel 15, like yeah, every other sentence. Yeah. I mean, it's uh, it, you know, they're not. It's not a nice word, you know. Uh, but boy, does it communicate uh, what we're talking about. You know, harlotry and whoring are great words. Um, so uh, Luther is interesting here because Luther, you know, is famous for saying, "What does the word say?" But then he can't quite bring himself to believe what the word says when it says God told one of his priests and prophets to marry a prostitute. So Luther decides that must, must be allegorical. Okay? And that was typical of, of Luther's uh, day, the thinking of Luther's day uh, among the Lutherans. Uh, today, uh, most scholars will tell you, mm, no, it was probably really, he really did marry a prostitute. Uh, and, and we'll talk more about that as, when we get into it. Um, the background on Hosea, uh, he was the only prophet to prophesy in the northern kingdom, Israel, uh, which was also, uh, and he was also from the northern kingdom. The only one from the northern kingdom to prophesy in the northern kingdom, uh, which is kind of interesting. Uh, it doesn't really mean much, but it's kind of interesting. Uh, he's a contemporary of Amos, Isaiah, and Micah. And his prophecy spanned several kings. Okay, now, you, you see that I gave you the kings there, the sheet on the kings, so you can kind of get an idea of, of where Hosea fits. Uh, the, the, the kingdom divided in 931 BC. Uh, uh, Rehoboam and Jeroboam uh, were, the, were the two kings uh, of the, the, the divided kingdom. Judah was the southern kingdom. Israel was the northern kingdom. And so essentially, Judah and the Levites were in uh, Judah. Levites were the, the, the clan without a, without a land because they were the priests of the temple, right? So Judah and the Levites were in the southern kingdom. The other 10 tribes were in the northern kingdom. And so you've heard the phrase, the lost tribes of Israel, right? That's the 10 tribes that were... Uh, either killed or consumed or assumed by the Assyrians uh, when, when they were taken over. Those are the ten tribes. Uh, Rehoboam and Jeroboam. And then you can see the kings go down there. Uh, my one of my personal favorites, Jehoshaphat, just because it's a great name. No one names their children Jehoshaphat anymore. It's unfortunate. Uh, they should. Uh, you see, we, we've already covered Obadiah and Joel. Do you see the prophets there in the middle? Written in the middle, longwise or you know, horizontally. And so Obadiah uh, was uh, somewhere between 860 and 840. Uh, Joel, somewhere between 840 and 830. Uh, th th those are the ones we've covered on uh, so far. Then you go down a little further, next page. 
uh, and you'll see 780, you'll see Jonah show up. Uh, we're, Hosea and Amos, was Hosea first and Amos second, or Hosea first and Amos second? They're kind of contemporary, so we're just doing Hosea first, and then we'll do Amos, uh, I think. That's what I have planned. Um, let me check that make sure I'm not telling you the wrong thing. Uh, Jose, yeah, we're going to do Amos next. You know, both, they have them uh, one on top of the other here, but they're, they're both dated at around 760 uh, BC. Uh, so we'll do Hosea first and then we'll do Amos. Uh, and so you can see there, uh, if you find Jeroboam the second, that's uh, some, somewhere during the reign of Jeroboam the second is where Hosea begins his prophecy. Okay? And then you see uh, Zechariah, Shalom, Menahem, Pekah, Pekahiah, and Hoshea. And Hoshea uh, it was the, is the last king of Israel. Uh, interestingly enough, Hoshea and Hosea are the exact same word. And the only difference is the, uh, whether the S is pronounced S or SH. There's a, it's a dot on, in Hebrew. One, if it's a dot on this side, it's SH. If it's a dot on this side, it's S. It's the same letter, though. So Hoshea and Hosea are, it's kind of interesting that that's, that's the end of the kingdom. Um, and then on the, on the, on the uh, Israel side, Uzziah uh, is, is uh, where he starts. And then they go through Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. Okay, And maybe some of Hezekiah anyway. Maybe he was already done before Hezekiah took over. And Hezekiah, of course, is my favorite book of the Bible. You know, where everything that should have been written is, okay? Things that I make up. And, uh, and then you'll see uh, Manasseh, Amon, Josiah, and the next page, Josiah, uh, jo uh, Jehoaz was very short, uh, Jehoiakim, Jehoiachin, and Zedekiah, the last king of Judah before the Babylonian captivity, Okay. So that helps a little bit in understanding, you know, when you, as we read uh, Hosea, you can refer to that list and see who comes where. And then we're all gonna, also going to spend some time reading in 2 Kings uh, because that gives us the, the, you know, 2 Kings is the history book. Like Acts is the history book of the New Testament. Kings is the history book of the Old Testament, Kings and Chronicles. All right. Um, interestingly enough, his, uh, his name, uh, Hosea, means Yahweh saves. Yahweh saves. Who else's name means Yahweh saves? God. No, the name, though. I mean, God, Yahweh is the name of God, but what is who? Jesus. Jesus, yeah. <laughs> Jesus, exactly the same. Uh, it's Greek letters instead of Hebrew letters, but it means the same thing. Also, Joshua, exact same thing. Also, Hoshea. The king, the last king, means the same thing. So, a pretty common name. Let's take a look at the history that's going to survive, surround uh, Hosea's prophecy. Uh, turn to Second Kings fourteen. And Amaziah is the same person as Uzziah. Sometimes it's written out as Amaziah, sometimes it's written out as Uzziah, but it's the same guy. 2 Kings 14. And we're going to read through some stuff here, so let's just take turns so I don't have to read, because we're going to read three chapters. So anybody not want to read? Nope, okay. Any, everybody else Okay. All right, so we'll start with Carol, and we'll just go around and read for a while until the spirit moves me. I tell you to stop. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, don't. Yeah. Here, here's the thing. Nobody in this church speaks Hebrew. Okay. So you're pretty safe. Okay. Um, in the second year of Jehoash, Jehoash, the son of Jehoaz, king of Israel, and Messiah the son of Joash, Joash, yes, I, Jewish. Judah, Judah, began to reign. He was 25 years old when he began to reign. And he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Jehoiadin. Jehoiadin, Jehoiadin of Jerusalem. And he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. 
yet not like David, his father. He did in all things as Joash, his father, had done, but the high places were not removed. The people still sacrificed and made offerings on the high places, and as soon as the royal power was firmly in his hand, he struck down his servants who had struck down the king, his father. But he did not put to death the children of the murderers, according to what is written in the book of the law of Moses, where the Lord commanded, Fathers shall not be put to death because of their children, nor shall children be put to death because of their fathers. But each one shall die for his own sin. He struck down 10,000 Edomites in the Valley of Salt and took Selah by storm and called it Jachthiel. Jachthiel, which is the name to this day. Okay, so this is the start of Uzziah. Uh, notice that he. this is where uh, uh, the king, whenever Hosea started, Uzziah was the king, uh, and called Amaziah here, but it's the same guy. Uh, he is 25 years old uh, when he begins to reign, and he reigned 29 years. Okay, and he and when it talks about uh, he he uh, he, uh, he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, yet not like David his father. He did in all things that Jewish his father had done, but the high places were not removed. So, what are the high places? Well, in Israel, they have uh, they have a problem. Where do you go to worship? Where, do you, where does every good Jew have to go worship? Where's the temple? Where's Jerusalem? Yeah, but in which country? Judah. Where's all the money stay that goes to the temple? Yeah, Judah. Yeah, Judah's not sharing. And so all the people of the 10 tribes of Israel have to go to Judah to dump all their money, uh, to, to give offerings to the temple. All right, now you and I understand these are offerings to God, and it doesn't matter. And if you do what God tells you to do, you'll be fine. Okay, But that's not how human beings think, is it? Uh, we, we just had, uh, at the board meeting this last week, we just had a discussion about this. Uh, and and uh, Bishop Hardy uh, is strong enough, a strong enough bishop to say when a congregation votes with their purse strings because they're not happy with the district and stops giving money, that is sin. Okay? And there's a lot of congregations that are really squirming because he says stuff like that. Uh, when you reduce your offerings to district, that is, and, and your offerings have not been reduced from, from your people, that is sin. Which is why I bring this up at every voters meeting any time they try to reduce the amount of offerings to the district, I ask the question, did we bring in less money last year than we did the year before? Oh, no, no, we brought in more. Then why would we reduce our offerings? Shouldn't we increase our offerings? No. I mean, doesn't that make sense? Isn't that exactly what we're asking our people to do? Well, yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, if, if you make uh, $10,000 this year, and you give a percentage of that, and you make $20,000 next year and give a percentage of that, you don't have to be a scholar to figure out, you know, should that be more or less? You know, we don't need to call Keith Spears, the mathematics professor, and, and get some help on this, you know. It's pretty obvious. And yet churches do this all the time. We did. Huh? We did. Yeah, I know we did. Our was zero. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I know, <laughs> I know, and you, 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 you have heard me scream and rant and rave and you know throw you know many tantrums every time. Uh, you normally not at the voters meeting. Normally I reserve that for the stewardship meeting, uh, but uh, you know or the council meeting or wherever. Uh, but I, you know I'm I'm not going to stop poking it because I, you can vote you can vote me down as many times as you want. I have, I only have, I'm just like anybody else in this congregation. I have one vote. Okay? But I'm not going to stop saying it's wrong to reduce your giving when your income is going up. Okay? And human beings love, uh, here's my favorite one. Uh, I served a church one time that said, well, we're, we're reducing our gift to the district because we're keeping that money for uh, missions uh, in, in our area. Oh, you're going to, at that time, we were given 20,000, I think, to the district and they reduced it to 10. 
I, I, I don't, I'm sorry, I don't see 10,000 extra dollars going someplace else. Well, you know, we have this building program. And so we're increasing our ministry presence in this area. So that 10,000 is going towards the mortgage on the new building. No, that's like saying I can't give to church because I'm buying a bigger house. <laughs> I'm increasing my home ministry. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's, it's just, uh, you know, it, people don't like to hear it, but it's just sin. Okay? And so Pete, what, what Israel's thinking, are they, now, let's say that Israel had said, the Lord said to give to him uh, 10%. In those days, it was more like 33% because it was 10% uh, tithe on one thing and a 10% tithe on another thing and a 10% tithe on another thing and a 3% tithe on another thing. By the time you added it all up, it was like 33% was the tithe. Uh, and so the Lord said, give 33%. We're going to give 33% and it's, it, let him work out the details uh, as to where Israel gets the money back. You think the Lord would have taken care of Israel? Yes. Yes, no matter, uh, no matter what checks you've ever written to the church, none of you have ever gone hungry. You, know, you might not have been able to buy that new whatever or go, go to that place because oh, you know, I don't have to give to the church. But you've never gone hungry. You've never gone without clothing. Nobody's ever shown up to church naked because they didn't have any clothes. You know, it's, it's, it, God always takes care of us. And it will be the same with the, with the congregation. The congregation who is faithful in their giving to district, which goes up the chain, by the way. You understand that, right? We give, you give to the congregation, the congregation gives to district, gives, district gives to Senate. Okay? Do you know that the English district is one of, I'm not sure now, right now, I think five, one of five districts that has not reduced its giving to Senate, even though our giving at district has been, has been dropping every year. Every year, our district, uh, our gifts from the congregations drops. You know, we've dropped here. We've dropped from, we were, when I got here, we were, not long after I got here, we got, we had it up to about 21,000 a year. Now we're down to 15. Every year, it keeps incrementalizing. Oh, well, just, we're just we have to get $1,000 on the budget. We have to get another thousand, another thousand. I haven't noticed we've been hurting for anything around here. <laughs> you know, I mean, we are, we are in fat city. We have new boilers. We have new, new, you know, new decorated rooms. We have nice everything. We have an up-to-date organ. We have, I mean, we have pianos running out our ears. You know, we're not hurting for anything. And in my mind, how dare we say, oh, we need to reduce our gift to district. You know, but I'm just one voice. So we'll see what happens next year. Uh-huh. Yeah. A thousand here, fifteen hundred there. You know, every year it's like, well, we have to balance the budget. We don't ever have a balanced budget. Come on, that's a fantasy. And why is that the place to balance it? Because it's easy. Why did Israel not want to send their money to Judah? They're not gonna try to turn off your electricity The district's gonna come in and say, What are they gonna tell us? Yeah. You know, they can't they can't they have no hammer. Just like if, if you stop giving, I don't have any hammer. I can't go and say, I'm going to repossess your car. You know, you, you have no hammer. It, you have to, you know, either you believe in biblical stewardship or you don't. If you believe in biblical stewardship, if you believe what God says, then you never reduce giving unless your income reduces. If your income reduces, well, yeah, obviously, because it's, it should be percentage based if you need, if you need to. I mean, some people have their income reduced and they say, well, I'm fine. I, I, you know, I don't really need that money anyway. But if you need that money and that income's reduced, yes, surely your giving would be reduced as well, percentage wise. But, uh, but I, you know, anyway, the bishop is, is pretty harsh about saying that. Uh, and, and he will tell, tell you that he expects every church in the district, every one of the 167 churches to give something. The same exact thing he says to his people at our Savior Lutheran Church in Heartland, Michigan. I expect every person here to give something. I understand if you can't give as much as you should give, but give something. You know what happens when you start giving something? Every time you give more. Every time. When you start regularly, faithfully giving something, pretty soon that something becomes more and more and more until you get up to where you should be giving. 
Yeah. It happens every time. I've never seen it fail. Uh, I've seen it fail where people go from zero to 60 in one week. And then they're like, oh, I can't do this. This is terrible. I so I always tell people, figure out what you know you can give. And if you say, I spend every dime I make, I will say, what, can, what one thing can you sacrifice each week, each week to give to the Lord? Okay. Well, I don't have to have that latte that I always get on okay. Thursdays. Okay. You know, what is that? About $15 <laughs> at Starbucks, you know? It's at least seven. You know, there you go. Promise the Lord $7 a week. Give the Lord $7 a week every week as faithful as clockwork. And I guarantee you, you will see blessings flow in. And next year, you'll be able to say, you know, I can give more than $7 a week. I can give $15 a week. And blessings will roll in again. It happens every time. It happens the same thing to congregations and the same way to districts. When the district when, when when the district got serious about saying we are not we are digging in we are not reducing our pledge to synod i mean literally we have more money than we can deal with right now we have so much money it's ridiculous and we have and we have, we have money to give away that nobody's asking for we have over four hundred thousand dollars to give away this year because the stock market has yeah. done so well yeah. right yeah, well, we're using it. We're using it uh, a large chunk. We're using to help uh, church workers pay off debt, uh, pay off uh, school debt. Uh, we've got. Uh, we're starting um, a new mission uh, to be announced. We're not sure exactly where it's going to happen, but there's going to be a new mission start. Um, we're we're um, we have the we have a lot of excitement going on in Canada uh, with uh, churches that because the Lutheran Church Canada closed their Lutheran Church Extension Fund because they, they, couldn't, they couldn't make it anymore. And, and we bought it out. Uh, and so we own, uh, we, we, we're, not, we're not allowed to plant churches in Canada uh, with the, because the LCC agreement with the Lutheran Church Canada. So the LCMS can't plant churches in Canada because LCC says that's our territory. So instead we just started buying them. So, so now we just hold the paper on a lot of LCC churches. But, you know, I mean, we got to do something with the money, you know. Yes, funny you should ask, <laughs> because I'm working on it. Uh, where uh, Derek Mathers and I are working on a uh, bulletin insert. Be brother? What's that? Jerry Mathers' brother. Jerry Mathers brother, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have to tell him that. No, he's the um, he's the executive uh, for missions uh, out of Toronto, and he and I are working together to put together a bulletin insert, uh, a series of bulletin inserts that'll come out at least twice a year, uh, at saying, "Hey, what is the English dis district and what is it doing?" And each one will look at different facets of what it's doing because I think there's a lot of people who still don't know what the English district is or even what a district is I was just talking to someone and explaining the English district to them and they were nor they were coming from northern Illinois and they and I realized soon in the conversation they had no idea what the northern Illinois district was much less the English district because people just you know we, I guess we don't talk about it as much as yeah 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 Dave I was going to say uh, there was a time when this church was really kind of known for giving and it was tied to mission work. Mm -hmm. People always stepped up, mm -hmm. you know, and, and mm -hmm. we were kind of known for that. Yeah, we've plant, we planted Palm Coast, Florida, and we planted uh, Wing Haven in um, Missouri. Yeah. yeah, we well, we helped plant Wing Haven. We did, we kind of almost halfway planted uh, Palm Coast. We were about half the money that went into that. Well, the English district is known for going into territory where no man will go. You know, <laughs> we're known for for missions in places that other people say, "No, nah, we can't do that." Like we just um, we're working with a church in Fairbanks, Alaska, right now uh, that is will probably be coming into the English district. Uh, we're talking to another one in Anchorage that may be coming in the English district because they're uh, missions that the Northwest District is saying. 
we just can't support this. It's too, it's too risky. It's too small. It's too whatever. And English uh, will go into those places uh, where other districts just, or we're working in, um, we have an opportunity. I don't know, we, we don't know what will happen or not, but we have some opportunities in college ministries. Uh, in districts where, where, um, yeah, we, I mean, we, we, some of most, I would say, uh, our second highest mission dollar bill is uh, college ministry. Uh, our campus ministry on uh, University of Michigan is huge. University of Arizona uh, is huge, uh, and we are uh, in negotiations now in the University of Arizona. We're, we're revamping that whole thing. We got a new missionary called there, uh, who's uh, doing a great job. And we're doing a lot of work there with Slippery Rock in Pennsylvania is a big, big campus ministry. Princeton is one of our big, bigger campus ministries. Yeah. So yeah, we we have a lot of a lot of money that goes into that. So yeah, we're that's what we do. What's that? the the district? How much do we give to Senate? Is that what you're asking? Yes. What is? I I can't remember. I don't remember. I'd have to look it up again. I don't remember. Oh, no, 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 no. I mean, it's a percentage of our budget. And so our budget is um, 400. Uh, no, it's the district budget. District yeah. budget. Yeah. I remember we, I think we used to try to base it on like 400,000 or something and do a tithe. For our tithe, we yeah. We added up to over, like you said, a little over 20,000. Right. It was, a, we I think, even there. 20 or 22, something like that. Yeah. But we were trying to work it up to that. You know? Yeah. And then all of a sudden it started dropping. But then add on to the other missions. That wasn't our only mission. So I was okay with that. Even though, you know, even though I, I would prefer 10% off the top to go to district, I was okay as long as you can make all the missions add up to 10%, which, which supposedly they, they tell me they still can. Uh, they can still make it all add up to 10%. So we'll see. Uh, let me see here the yeah, last. The argument too that like if all your expenses are going up, they effectively that's the same as your income going down. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, all I, you know, all I, but it's not. I mean, we can't do, you can't do that because, um, because that, I mean, if, if our people did the same thing, if I said, well, I'm going to reduce my tithe because my property taxes went up, that's putting the, that's kind of, you know, the tail's wagging the dog now. It's the same thing in the district, though. There's a the beer that's going up, there's a going up, too, you know. They can't afford it. People cut back, you know. Right, and yet people are. And yet the Lord is still blessing us amazingly. Uh, let's see if I can find here. So district congregations uh, support from district congregations total without restrictions is 1.3 million is what the district brings in. Yeah, that's their total assets. Uh, total, I mean, total, I mean, total income. Uh, with no, we were we we run on a we run on a, a shoestring. I'm telling you right now. Yeah. We give one hundred and sixty-five thousand to Senate. Okay. One hundred sixty-five thousand four hundred fifty-eight thirty-three. Um, one hundred sixty-seven congregations. That's what the district gives to Senate. I know. Yeah. Yep. So, so, so the the congregations give to district. Yeah. And theoretically, they all take ten percent of their income and give to district. District then takes ten percent of our income, which is more than ten percent because we're at one point three million. We're giving one hundred and sixty-five thousand away. Okay. And we send it up the line to send it. Now that's not, not that's not counting other missions and schools and things like that. That's just this just the gift to send it. Yeah. yeah. Then our our total gifts and grants uh, budget year to date is four hundred and thirty five thousand dollars for last year. That was our closing from our closing. Let's see. Well, that was December thirty one. So it's that's the total grants that we gave out up through December last year. 
four hundred thirty-five thousand four hundred twenty dollars. The English district. Yeah, 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 that's yeah, yeah. Well, that's you know we have a bishop who demands it, and 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 thankfully, uh, I'll say Danya says it's more of an attitude about giving that it takes money to do God's work, and it's not magic and things that things just happen. Pastors and doctors were paid by chickens many years yes. ago. Yes. But for some people, chickens were all they had to give, but they were giving to God. Right. Yeah. That's going to be Sarah saying she doesn't want chickens. <laughs> Let's see. Oh, she said no. So she says, so we give to district, give, district gives to synod. What does synod do with the gift? May have missed that part. Oh, well, yeah, synod is uh, the, no, world, not world relief. That's a separate agency. Uh, Synod is, that's, I don't know what that is, scam likely, that's, that's what that is. Uh, Synod then uh, supports uh, to some, to some level of educa the education ministries for the, for the university system and the seminaries, not as much as they used to, but they still do some. Uh, missionaries worldwide, uh, all the foreign missionaries are supported that way. Uh, all of the, um, well, yeah, I mean, that's, yeah, not all of it, but, you know, to, to, like their training and all that kind of stuff is supported by the Synod. Uh, of course, the bureaucracy of the Synod, all the paperwork that comes out, all of the, the conventions and all that kind of stuff. Um, the uh, Center for uh, Political Affairs is, is helped by Synod. So, you know, Synod, and, and Synod's under the same restriction, under the same problems that everyone else is, is the districts keep cutting their gift. You know, less and less and less. And, and uh, we have a great bishop at Synod, too, who has uh, done some really creative financing. Uh, for one thing, he sold our, um, he sold our property in uh, Japan. And I'd be, <laughs> she said, I'd be okay getting paid in chickens if I had to. She likes chicken. Uh, uh, he sold our property. I'm oh, in Hong Kong. That's where it was. He sold our property in Hong Kong that we were uh, basing our mission offices out of in the East for millions of dollars. And we, we had bought it for practically nothing back in the day, you know, and then relocated to a, a place, I think it was Taiwan, which was much, much cheaper. And he got the, got the property, he got the new office building for a song. And with all the profit, he paid off all of the university debt. So all the money that the universities owed to Synod for years and years and years, he, he was able to cancel all of that debt. Yeah, millions. I don't know. I think some developer or something. I think they were, you know, because Hong Kong land prices, I mean, they're through the roof. Yeah. And so we moved, I think we moved to Taiwan is where we moved. What's that? That's Senate. Yep. Yep. Senate puts a lot of money into the youth gathering. Yeah to try to keep costs down so that kids can attend. I mean, it's expensive enough even without that, but you no, know, they, they pour a lot of money into that too. Yep, National Youth Gathering. Um, okay. That stemmed from uh, Israel and Judah. <laughs> Back to Israel and Judah. Oh, my whole point, my whole point launched into that. Uh, I forgot my point. So Israel didn't like all their money going to Jerusalem. So they set up high places. They set up high places, which is a nice way of saying idols. They set up idols along the border and encourage people, no, 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 no. Make your sacrifices here, <coughs> excuse me, to these idols. And, and it'll be just as good. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Just make your sacrifices. Go back home. And so, and, and God kept telling the kings, that's not pleasing to me. And they kept saying, hey, God, look, it's finances, okay? You worry about religious stuff. We'll take care of the, the money, okay? That's, God does not do that. God never does that. God always has his fingers in the pot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, it was, it's, it's all about money. And so, and they kept on sinning against him. And, and, you know, we can look at it and we can shake our heads and shame on them. But look how much of that same kind of stuff still happens. How God is dismissed. God says this, 
yeah, well, you know, that was culturally influenced, and that was that time, and that was, uh, that was, you know, it's not that way anymore, and everybody's doing it, and, you know, we come up with a 15 million excuses as to why it's okay for me to do whatever it is I want to do. It's the same thing. Yeah, it's the same thing. Was that kind of like what they were doing in Hosea? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This was going on still in Hosea. Oh, yeah. This is this is Second uh, Second Kings fourteen is Hosea's time. This is what's going on. Okay, uh, Deb, we'll pick up at verse eight. Then Amaziah. Amaziah sent messengers to Jehoash, yeah, the son of Jehoaz, son of Jeru, king of Israel, saying, "Come, let us look one another in the face." Jehoshaphat, king of Israel, sent word to Amaziah, the king of Judah. A thistle on Lebanon sent to was sent to a cedar on Lebanon, saying, "Give your daughter to my son for a wife." And a wild beast of Lebanon passed by and trampled down the thistle. You have indeed struck down Edom, and your heart is lifted you up. Be content with your glory and stay at home. For why should you provoke trouble so that you fall and Judah with you? You and Judah with you, you, yeah. And Judah with you. But Amaziah would not listen. What a shock. (laughs) So Jehoshaphat, king of Israel, went up, and and Amaziah, king of Judah, faced one another in battle at Beth Shemesh, which belongs to Judah. And Judah was defended by Israel. Defeated. Defeated. And Judah was defeated by Israel, and every man fled to his home. And Jehoshaphat, king of Israel, captured Amaziah, king of Judah, the son of Jehoshaphat, son of Amaziah, of Beth Shemesh, and came to Jerusalem and broke down the wall of Jerusalem for 400 cubits from Ephraim gate to the corner gate. And he seized all the gold and silver and all the vessels that were found in the house of the Lord and in the treasuries of the king's house, also hostages, and he re- returned to Samaria. Okay, you know why Samaritans and Jews hate each other? There you go. <laughs> there you go, because the the uh, king of Samaria, the of Israel, who lived in Samaria, sacked uh, Jerusalem. Okay, because they're having this fight over uh, over where you worship. Okay, go ahead, um, uh, Marilyn. <clears throat> Azariah. Oh, Azariah, who was 16 years old, and they had came to succeed his father Amaziah. He rebuilt Elah and restored it to Judah after King Amaziah spoke to his ancestors. In the 15th year of King Amaziah, son of... Okay. Oh, yep. Yeah. Uh, so now we're getting, now, now we're getting to, to uh, where Hosea comes in, Jeroboam the second. Go ahead. In the 15th year of King Amaziah, son of Joash of Judah, King Jeroboam, son of Joash of Israel, began to reign in Samaria. He reigned 41 years. He did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. He did not depart from all the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebash. That's the first Jeroboam. Yeah. Which he called Israel to sin. He restored the border of Israel from Oh, Label Hamath. As far as the Sea of the Arabah, according to the word of the Lord, the God of Israel, which he spoke by his servant Jonah. Ah, there you go. There's Jonah. Son of Amitai. Amitai. Yeah. The prophet, who was from And that's why we know that Jonah is a Jew and not, uh, and not a, an Israelite uh, or not a Gentile, as some have suggested, is it tells you right there he's from Gath Hefer. The Lord saw that the distress of Israel was very 
for dinner. There was no one left, bound or free, and no one to help Israel. But the Lord had not said that he would blot out the name of Israel from under heaven, so he saved him by the hand of Jeroboam, son of Joash. Now the rest of the acts of Jeroboam, and all that he did in his fight, how he fought and how he recovered for Israel, Damascus and Hamath, which have belonged to Judah, are they not written in the book of the angels of the kings of Israel? Jeroboam slept with his ancestors, the kings of Israel, his son Zechariah succeeded him. Okay. So now we begin with Azariah in chapter 15. Judy? So yeah. Slept with his fathers means he died? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's the way they, that's the euphemism for death. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we don't have anything gay going on here. <laughs> <laughs> sounds funny. Yeah. In the 27th year of Jeroboam, king of Israel, Azariah, the son of Amaziah, king of Judah, began to reign. Okay, hold on a second. If you look on your sheet, you see Amaziah, seven, seven, uh, second page. Amaziah, 796 to 767. And then Uzziah, which is what Hosea says, that he, he Hosea talks about the, about King Uzziah, uh, 792 to 740. And then we don't, it's hard to find an Uzziah here. So Azariah is Uzziah, right? Yeah, same person. And and why they're why they're called different names is hard to tell. So Azariah is the same as Uzziah. So Amaziah is seven ninety six sixty seven. Then Uzziah comes in seven ninety two to seven forty, and that's Azariah. Okay, go ahead. Verse two. He was sixteen years old when he began to reign, and reigned fifty two years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Jechaliah of Jerusalem, and he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, according to all that his father Amaziah had done. Nevertheless, the high places were not taken away. All right, we've still got the high places where they're collecting extra, extra money here. People still sacrificed and made offerings on the high places. And the Lord touched the king so that he was a leper to the day of his death, and he lived in a separate house. And Jotham, the king's son, was over the household governing the people of the land. Now the rest of the acts of Azariah and all that he did are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the king of Judah, kings of Judah? And Azariah slept with his fathers, and they buried him with his fathers in the city of David, and Jotham his son reigned in his place. Okay, so if you look back real quick at, at uh, uh, Hosea again, you see, come on, my computer's being slow. There we go. The word of the Lord came to Hosea, the son of Beri, in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. Okay, so now we're at Jotham. All right, so back to, come on, back to 2 Kings. Every line that says, is it not written, it's a question, is it right. not written in the book of Chronicles? It kind of just twice. Yeah, this is a way of saying it is. Okay. Yeah, the, the the Chronicles of the Kings. This is this is all recorded okay. in that. All right, so we are at verse eight. Zechariah reigns in Israel, right? Mm -hmm. So you stop. Yeah, in the thirty. I'll go in the thirty eighth year of Azariah, king of Judah. Zechariah, the son of Jeroboam, reigned over Israel in Samaria six months, and he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, as his fathers had done. He did not depart from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, which he made Israel to sin. Shalom, the son of Jabesh, conspired against him and struck him down at Iblim and put, them, put him to death and reigned in his place. Now the rest of the deeds of Zechariah, behold, they are written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Israel. This was the promise of the Lord that he gave to Jehu. Your sons shall sit on the throne of Israel to the fourth generation. And so it came to pass. Shalom. The son of Jabesh began to reign in the 39th year of Uzziah. And if you look at the, your thing on the kings, you can follow there. Uh, Jeroboam II, Zechariah, now we're at Shalom. Uh, Shalom, now ding dong. Uh, he reigned one month in Samaria. <laughs> he was uh, a yeah, little bit of a short uh, reign there. Then Menahem, the son of Gadai, came up from Tizrah 
and came to Samaria, and he struck down Shalom, the son of Jabesh, in Samaria, and put him to death and reigned in his place. Now the rest of the deeds of Shalom and the conspiracy that he made, behold, they are written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Israel. At that time, Menahem sacked Tiphesh and all who, said it, uh, who were in it and its territory from Tizra on, because they did not open it to him. Therefore he sacked it, and he ripped open all the women in it who were pregnant. That's, uh, he learned that from the Assyrians. Uh, is the, the way you make a statement uh, is you kill the male children and you rip open the pregnant women, making sure there's no progeny uh, that'll come back on you. Menahem in the 39th year of Azariah, king of Judah. So we're still, we're still in Uzziah's reign, right? Uh, Azariah, Uzziah. Menahem, the son of Gadai, began to reign over Israel, and he reigned 10 years in Samaria, and he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. He did not depart all his days from all the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, which he made Israel to sin. Pool, the king of Assyria, came against the land. And Menahem gave Pool a thousand talents of silver that he might help him to confirm his hold on royal power. What's wrong with that? Well, do we trust in God or do we trust in Putin? <laughs> you know, do we trust in God or do we trust in Biden? Who do we trust in? Do we trust in God or do we trust in Fauci? <laughs> See, we don't, we don't bring in, when God says, this is how it is, we don't look for other people, experts, you know, uh, experts to come in and tell us something different. But doesn't God lead the experts? What? Well, not, he would not lead the experts to say something different from what he said. Okay. Yeah, I mean, that's a good question. Be, don't don't doesn't God lead the experts? Lead, lead. So if Carol comes to me and says, yeah, well, I mean, only any time. I mean, if Carol comes to me and says, Pastor, um, I'm I'm you know I've been studying the scriptures and I really think that the body and blood of Christ are just symbols; they're not really present in the sacrament. Okay, then I'm going to have to say, well, what in Scripture led you to, to believe that? And, and she could, could show me things. I would show her the Greek, and I would show, teach her, and I would say, no, see, this is really, this, it says, this is my body. There are words for represents. He didn't use those. And so we are going to follow what God says. And if she says, well, I understand that, Pastor, but it just doesn't make sense. Okay? It doesn't make sense that that, that weird little chalky-tasting wafer is really the flesh of Christ that hung on the cross. It just doesn't make sense. I would say, you're absolutely right. It doesn't make sense. And we're still going to go with what God says. <laughs> See? So everything that an expert says, and it's, that's a running joke among pastors too, because if you ever want your congregation to hear from an expert, all you have to do is bring another pastor from 50 miles away. Yeah, because he's now an expert because he comes from 50 miles away. That's, that's the running joke, it's 50 miles away. So sometimes when we're in conferences, if someone says something really good, that we'll say, will you come tell my congregation that? Because you're an expert. <laughs> um, but anytime the expert, whatever the kind of expert it is, says something and it's not supported or it's, or it's denied by the word of God, we have to, if it's denied by the word of God, it's easy. Nope, sorry, we're not gonna do that. If it's not supported by the word of God, we have to say, okay, let's think about that. Does this impinge on the word of God? Is there a problem with that? So for instance, uh, there's no place in the word of God that says, uh, and churches shall not have transsexual bathrooms. Okay, it's not in there. Not even in third Hezekiah, because I've looked. Okay. Uh, but we have to say, okay, but if we, if the government tells us that we have to have transsexual bathrooms, um, how, what does that say about our understanding of sexuality and our belief that God creates us in the way that he intends for us to be and that it's not our place as human beings to decide that God got it wrong and that we should, so what are we saying by having such a bathroom, you know, for instance? Uh, not a problem around here because uh, we're not we don't have that but in in churches with schools it's going to be a big problem mm -hmm. real soon uh it's gonna there's just a matter of time for lawsuits start coming uh that you know little johnny who wants to be little sally wants to have her own bathroom 
uh, and doesn't want to have to be uh, in the bathroom that the boys are in. And so it's and sooner or later, some parent's going to sue a Christian school and it's going to start making its way up the court. And that's why we praise God that we have a six to three Supreme Court uh, that's that's going to prayerfully uphold uh, biblical values and not force the church into into doing something uh, that we just can't do. I mean, what will end up happening is a lot of our schools just close because we just can't do that. So that's what, yeah. So anytime, you're absolutely right. You, anytime the expert says something, we have to evaluate it. And we have to ask, is this consistent with the word of God or not? And if not, then we don't do it. So God uh, had told um, uh, Israel uh, how to live and how to avoid being taken over. Because remember, what do you get for keeping the Ten Commandments? Yeah, land and water. To be, to be perfectly crass about it, you know, land and water, you know, money and food. You get, you know, God takes care of you. You take care of the Ten Commandments, he takes care of you. You don't get salvation. Salvation's about faith in, in, in Christ. So Israel has decided, well, we're not going to follow the Ten Commandments. We're going to do things our own way. And we're going to bring in pool and we're going to give him some money. And then he can help us hold on to our royal power. Menahem, uh, verse 20, extracted the money from Israel, that is, from all the wealthy men, 50 shekels of silver from every man, to give to the king of Assyria, so that the king of Assyria turned back and did not stay there in the land. Now the rest of the deeds of Menahem and all that he did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings? And Menahem slept with his fathers, and Pekahiah, his son, reigned in his place. Uh, Pekahiah. In the 50, 50th year of Azariah, king of Judah, so Uzziah is still in Judah, Pekahiah, the son of Menahem, began to reign over Israel in Samaria, and he reigned two years. And he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. He did not turn away from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, which he made Israel to sin. And Pekah, the son of Remaliah, his captain, conspired against him with 50 men of the people of Gilead and struck him down in Samaria in the citadel of the king's house, with Argob and Aria, uh, no, yeah, Aria, uh, he put uh, put him to death and reigned in his place. Now the rest of the deeds of Pekahiah and all that he did were in the kings of the In the 52nd year of Azariah, Uzziah is still king in Judah, Pekah, the son of Remaliah, began to reign over Israel and Samaria, and he reigned 20 years. Boy, long one compared. <laughs> And he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. He did not depart from the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, which he made Israel to sin. In the days of Pekah, king of Israel, Tiglath-Pileser, who you've certainly heard of, king of Assyria, that's the king who, who we all hear of from Assyria, the, the real bad guy, came and captured Aijah, Abel, Beth, Makkah, uh, Janua, Kedesh, Hazer, Gilead, and Galilee, all the land of Naphtali, which is one of the tribes. And he carried the people captive to his, uh, Assyria. Then Hoshea, the son of Elah, made conspiracy against Pekah and the son of Remelah and struck him down and put him to death and reigned in his place in the 20th year of Jotham, the son of Uzziah. So finally Jotham's up. Now the rest of the acts of Pekah and all the king, all that he did, behold, they are written in the books of the Chronicles. Okay, so that's where we're going to stop for tonight with Jotham. Um, let me write that down so I don't forget. Second Kings 15, 32. Thank you. Um, so what what I want to, what I want us to be seeing from this is the horrendous amount of upheaval that's going on uh, among the people to whom Hosea is going to preach. Okay, Hosea is not preaching to a, a calm, happy little church in the valley. The, 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 this is, yeah, it makes what we, what we have in this country look like, you know, a, a visit from the Avon lady. You know, I mean, it's, it, it couldn't be easier for us. Imagine this kind of upheaval where the, imagine presidents uh, being, ex, be, being not, not voted out of office, but summarily executed one month into their reign uh, and not assassinated by some crazy guy, executed and then, and then the person who executes them takes over. 
This is the, the world that Hosea is proclaiming the message of God to. Uh, it's phenomenal. Uh, the, I mean, and, and this is just a, this is just a overview. I mean, you, you could read the, you can get into some histories and read the, some real detailed histories of this time, and the uh, the intrigue and the blood that was shed is just horrendous. Uh, also, remember, this is why the Jews hate Samaria, and were so offended when Jesus talked to the Samaritan woman and walk through their land as a rabbi. I mean, yeah, you can really understand it. I mean, it's not, it wasn't right that they were offended, but you can kind of understand it, you know, why this was so, and, and, the, and the reason that's so helpful to us uh, in, in this world and in our lives, Danya says, I would like those bathrooms if Sean Connery would share with me. <laughs> that's what, she wants the transsexual bathrooms if Sean Connery, if Sean Connery will share. Um, Right. But in 250 years, think of how many wars we've been in. Right. We've had pet presidents assassinated. Right. We have not been a whole lot different than what you, because this is all over hundreds of years, too. You know? Yeah. Well, not hundreds. No, it's only well, about over about 50 years. Stints, but, you know, when you look at the whole big picture. It's yeah. So, so what we read tonight is about 50 years. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. It's, it's a little more, but, but we're not exempt from this. No. You know? And you look at all the things that are going on around us. And the know? message is. Learn, you know. We, we have yeah. So yeah. We're, not, we're not exempt from this. That's uh, the truer words have never been spoken. We are not exempt from this. So learn, you know, learn what God expects from His people, and how God blesses His people when they when they follow His word, and ignore the the carryings on of the world around them. Of course the heathen are going to act like heathen. They're heathen. Okay. Of course. And you're never going to eliminate no. no. No, that's what Jesus meant when he said the poor will be with you always. Yeah. He didn't mean ignore the poor people. They don't matter. <laughs> he meant you're always going to have worldly troubles. Yeah. You got to focus on me. Keep your focus on me. And then the worldly troubles will all take care of themselves. You know, you're, they're not going to go away. Yeah. All right, let's close with the blessing. The Lord bless us and keep us. The Lord make his face shine upon us and be gracious unto us. The Lord lift up his countenance upon us and give us peace. Amen. So next week we will finish up with the reading in 2 Kings and we'll get further into uh, Hosea. We'll be in Hosea for a little while because it's a great book. So, so is the book of Chronicles of the Kings of Judah, is it Chronicles? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yep. You'll find that Chronicles... Um, oh, I'm going to end the video here. Good night, everybody.